And the first phase of any type of conflict, of any trigger is we all start as the victim. It's important for us to acknowledge our wounded parts. Many of us, there's two problems that I see with this whole victimhood story with the clients that we work with when we're healing trauma bonds. Person number one who constantly sees nothing but victimhood Hey, what is up? We are back with another Trigger Proof Transmission, this time inspired by a lovely question from a community member that I wanted to share. Uh, let's see. Let me just read it because it's pretty, pretty big. Here it is. So community member, her name's Sandra, just asked this question. I would appreciate some extra insight on how to know when you're playing the victim versus just needing to express your feelings on how you've been affected by someone else's actions versus needing or desiring validation versus not making others feel responsible for your feelings. I'm confused on how the concepts are different, similar, and what's healthy versus not healthy. I definitely don't want to play the victim or make others responsible, but how does one express themselves without those possibly happening? Is needing validation codependency? If so, is it always codependency or only in certain circumstances? How does one share their feeling without making the other person feel responsible? Wow. That's a difficult question. That's a toughie. And um, I want to talk a little bit about, I'm just going to riff on this comp conversation of victimhood, on this conversation of healthy, secure attachments and codependency. And as always, to help answer this, these questions, um, I'm going to use examples and I'm going to use a backstory to help you because the goal here is to have a knowing Essentially, what is the goal? The goal is to get to a place where we have a knowing about who we are to live. Here's the word I'm going to write down. This is the goal of becoming trigger proof. This is the goal of learning how to break cycles of intergenerational trauma. I'm going to write it down here, right here. Here it is. The goal is to be empathetically empathetic oh here let me <laughs> let me write it differently here <gasps> trying to be all fancy here with my ipad here it is this is the goal here are you ready this is what creates secure relationships and i want to uh, say thank you to kim the community manager we chat on a call almost every day and i just riff and transmute that's my zone of genius. I just answer questions. It comes through me and then this word comes out. And this word came out. that came through very, very clearly. And I really want you to get it. And here it is. Empathetically. Unapologetic. There it is. Here's your goal. The essentially the goal of the work that I do with people, the goal of the work that I do with people in our cycle breakers program is to help you is to help people who are really place a high value on healing, place a high value on relationships, place a high value on upgrading themselves into becoming souls that can contain secure relationships. Those are the people in our programs is to learn how to become empathetically unapologetic. What does that mean? You can even go the other way. You can be unapologetically empathetic. Either way, it's a really great uh, kind of state of being to go into. What does that mean? It means 
I'm not going to abandon myself. I'm going to share with you my feelings unapologetically, yet to be able to artfully do it in a way that's empathetic towards you and myself. In other words, both parties in this dynamic, both parties, there's you and there's me, both parties are respected. Now, imagine you and I are friends and our friendship, it was um, kind of designed in such a way where I never really told you how I felt. I never told you when you would say something that maybe crossed a boundary. I never indicated to you when you said something that I perceived to be very hurtful and I just kind of like stuffed it away. How would you feel if you knew that that was happening? You probably wouldn't feel that great about it, would you? You probably wouldn't feel that great. Well, that's because you aren't being empathetically unapologetic. Becoming empathetically unapologetic is the way to create the relationships and the life that you desire. It's the way that you have, it's the only way to have a fulfilling experience of life because not only are you respectful towards the other person because of empathy, but most importantly, you're empathetic and respectful to yourself. Now, why don't we? Why aren't we all this way automatically? Well, to and, and also to answer, you know, Sandra's question that I just read, um, we have to go back and understand why we are the way we are. And I, you know, I'm trained as a chiropractor. So, you know, my first thought when I do all these lives, Facebook lives and podcast episodes and all of that is what business do I have in really teaching you this? And what I want you to know is from my 20 years experience as a chiropractor, I'm coming at it from a health standpoint. Everything that I'm teaching you first and foremost came from a quest to really understand and unpack where health comes from. I used to think, well, I, I was trained in the nervous system. And as a chiropractor, I remove interference from the nervous system so people can feel uh, kind of a sense of ease and safety in the nervous system. The problem is what happens if that lack of safety is because of a relational attachment trauma, a breakup, grief, and losing somebody, um, codependent kind of push-pull dynamics where one day the person is all in, the next person they're just giving you little breadcrumbs, they ignore you, ignore you, ignore you, and then finally you're like, I'm out of here, and then finally they start love bombing you. And you have this weird toxic kind of push-pull dynamic where both parties are anxious, attached, avoidant, and, 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 you know, you're dealing with an infidelity and now you're, you're, you don't feel safe in your body because of that. When you come to me as a chiropractor, I'm definitely going to help you when you lay on the table and I do an adjustment, but I was constantly thinking, all right, am I really getting to the root cause? So several years ago, I gave myself permission first to go upstream in my own life and to figure out all of my kind of codependent relational dynamics that I wasn't even aware of, even though I'm a smart guy. And I thought to myself, once I've figured this whole trauma bond system out, because my last relationship was a trauma bond where it was like highly sexually charged, extreme ups, extreme downs. Should I stay or go? Well, fuck, there's no way I'm going to marry this person because they're definitely not all the, all, in, uh, you know, I'm definitely not all in, but she would just complain and, not do anything about it. So I was like, all right, I'll just keep, I'll just keep going. She didn't, you know, uh, as I didn't really want to, I had this paralyzing fear of commitment after my divorce, which many men have. They're like, I'm not going to put myself in that situation. And then I would date one anxious partner after another who was always trying to rope me into a relationship. And I was like, fuck, I'm never going to, I'm never going to figure out how to have a secure relationship because I want a relationship, but I don't want to feel trapped in it. And I definitely don't want somebody who expects to, 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 you know, me to give them a ring and is constantly like objectifying me as somebody to, you know, 
get get them a ring, you know, because they didn't love themselves. And and as it turned out, as I did my inner work, I realized I was objectifying them. They were only treating me to the same degree that I was treating them. I had to really look at myself and see where I was playing the victim, which is the topic of today's um, conversation. And so in so going through that journey, walking the path of breaking this cycle, I realized it wasn't didn't even start with me. It came in from my parents, 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 which is really what I want you to know, that everything that you're dealing with right now didn't begin with you. So you can take a <sighs> deep breath and surrender and really not be kind of paralyzed by the shame of the relationship situation that you find yourself in because it's not your fault. I mean, what was the what was the modeling that you received? Guess what? That's the information you download into your system. It's not like a cognitive knowledge. It's a contextual one. It's who you are. You know, we see people who have codependency. And I remember this one, one woman, my heart breaks for her. She was in our overview experience and she's two years still complaining about the same thing. She came to the overview experience years ago or breath work a couple of years ago. And then came back not having changed anything and just by her language I could hear that she still has uh is embodying that same identity of a doormat waiting for fucking breadcrumbs not able to ex exert her boundaries thinking that one kind of session is going to magically change it where two three four five years down the road time will keep ticking and there, there literally will be no change unless we actually plant our flag in the ground and say, enough, I'm willing to be the one to rescue me. And those are the people that DM me and say, I'm ready to do the work. And still, when they say that, there's still many aren't ready because as soon as the fear comes up, you know, it, it takes a monumental amount of courage which is what I'm trying to tell you, to break free from that old identity of being a victim to other people. So essentially all of that to say it's possible when you're committed to the path, walking the path of the cycle breaker to receiving guidance, to learning how to receive first. Receiving guidance is a big one. People think that they can heal just by watching YouTube videos or listening to podcasts. And unfortunately it these patterns run so deep, we have to, we need a little bit more kind of hands on. I certainly didn't do, I mean, I love watching YouTube videos, reading books, listening to books, um, but that's not what causes transformation. Transformation can own of these patterns can only happen when our body is involved. It can't happen if you're just kind of like a cognitive knowledge. Here's the five steps, and you're like, okay, I'll remember. And then, six weeks from now, you haven't implemented anything because there's no, um, there's no feedback, right? It's like learning how to dance from sitting and listening, sitting and being in a classroom and listening to the teacher say, left foot forward, right foot back, switch and shift your weight onto the right hip and then go forward. Go. You got it. How's the dance move looking now? Essentially, healing our trauma patterns, our trauma bonds, um, involves us going inside and learning how to shift that pattern within the body. If we don't get the body involved, there's no real embodiment of the change. It's kind of like you know, if your mother read all the science, uh, read all the psychology books. It's kind of like my mom; she was always reading a new psychology book. Right. And she's, oh, my going to therapy. But did I ever see any change in her behavior? No. Because you can't think your way or cognitive cog cognition your way out of healing. So let's talk about victimhood. First thing I want to share is that to heal, we must, there are stages of our healing or stages of our spiritual development. And the first one is that of victimhood. Okay, so we all start, let me write that down. So we all start as the victim. So Sandra, when you're with your question, you know, am I being the victim here? The answer is yes, we all start off as the victim. If you uh, set up an appointment with us, 
is what happens to us, to me as well. You set up an appointment, this happens with our discovery calls. Um, people were like, all right, I'm ready to break the cycle. And then they will book a call in with my team. And then they would no show. And I'd be like, fuck, this is our time. We took the time to do it. Fuck. And I would be the victim to somebody ghosting without letting us know, without rescheduling. And the first phase of any type of conflict, of any trigger is we all start as the victim. It's important for us to acknowledge our wounded parts. Many of us, there's two problems that I see with this whole victimhood story with the clients that we work with when we're healing trauma bonds. Person number one who constantly sees nothing but victimhood which, by the way, if you have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, histrionic, those kind of cluster B personality types, the hallmark of these cluster B personality types is constant victimhood. Like you are a victim, the end. To see it any other way is impossible. This is very highly narcissistic. Our narcissistic parts are constant victims. That's why it's so difficult to be in a relationship with a narcissist because everything you say is taken as an attack. If I have a feeling toward, let me give you an example. If I have a feeling uh, or I give you feedback and I'm like, you know, it, it, you, you're pretty aggressive with the way that you're taught. I feel really like the way that you're sharing with me as it says, if I say, hey, can I give you some feedback here, Sandra? And you say, yes, sure. I go, the way that, uh, you know, I don't know if it's at your intention, but the way that you are sharing this with me, it's bringing up a lot of my defenses because of your tone. And I'm not sure what your intention is, but it feels a lot, feels very aggressive. I'm wondering if you can alter the way that you're sharing that so that it can land a little better. Now, that's my attempt that's my attempt at being empathetically unapologetic. That's how Nima, who's done his healing work and honors how he's feeling, but feels victimized by how you're saying it to me, that's how I'll bring it up. Now, the way that you respond to it, if you go, what? I thought you teach people how to be trigger proof. How dare you take what I say as an attack? Why don't you just practice what you preach and you turn around and you come at me and you don't listen and you play victim to my feedback. Now, th this is kind of like, I could, you know, that's kind of like your inner Kanye West. Do you know what I mean? You're in victimhood. So I'm sharing, first of all, I gave you, per I, I asked for permission. I asked for consent. Can I share with you what just came up for me? I really know that that's not your intent. But when you said it this way, this is what came up for me. I know that wasn't your intent. I'm wondering how you feel about that. Empathetic, yet unapologetic. Because, yeah, everybody feels victimized depending on the tone, depending on my bandwidth of receptivity in that moment. I'm not just a solitary fucking robot. I'm a human being, right? So... Some days, depending on how I'm feeling, depending on the state of my nervous system, depending on, you know, what's happening in my personal life, let's say you and I are coworkers, I'm not going to be as receptive to certain things in the tone. So when it's said in a certain way, I might feel attacked. I might feel wounded and victimized and it brings up all of my past stuff. But because I've done my own healing work and I've gotten to a place of unapologetic empathy, I can now first ask for consent to say, hey, is, do you have a bandwidth right now for me to give you some feedback on what's come up? No? Okay, cool. Let me know when your bandwidth is like 9 or 10 out of 10. Because there's something that came up and I don't feel great about it and I'm kind of nervous to bring it up with you because I don't want to feel like I'm, being, I'm, I'm playing the victim here. But this really came up and let me know if you'd like to find out why. See what I did there? I, I was empathetic and unapologetic towards myself 
and to respect the container of my friendship with you, I fucking told you. <laughs> You're gonna wanna be friends with somebody like me who isn't gonna fucking sugarcoat it, but is empathetic with both of us. This is how I've been able to have only secure relationships in my life. Now, I had understand if you're not there yet because you've taken on the identity of being a doormat, why don't we, why aren't we empathetically unapologetic with our own values and our feelings? Because we have been shamed or we were raised with parents who felt narcissistically injured whenever we would give them feedback. My name is Dr. Nima Romani, and you've been listening to The Trigger Proof, designed to teach you the most important skill necessary for a dramatically changing world, which is nervous system regulation. And becoming trigger-proof doesn't mean trigger-less. It means learning how to regulate ourselves to bring us back to center so that we can then be governed by our purpose rather than from our wounds. Anytime there's reactivity, there's a wound. And if you're curious and inspired to learn more, join us at Breathwork and Badassery or the Overview Experience. There's a difference between listening to a podcast and actually showing up live and doing the work with a badass community who's all about breaking cycles of intergenerational trauma. It didn't start with you, but it can end with you if you're willing to do the work. See you at the next perfect time. They weren't able to contain their shame and their guilt, so they would defend, turn it around, deny our reality. So when you're used to having your reality denied, you then deny your own reality, right? So then you internalize it. Or that's the, you know, and you're constantly feeling victimized, okay? That's type number one that I shared. Type number two is the person who deliberately says, no, I'm not a victim and denies their wounding, denies their pain in an effort to be strong and not, you know, play the victim. In those cases, there's a wounded part of us that feels gaslit by ourselves, and those people will become doormats. I know one of the clients that I worked with, he was, he, it was a he, he was literally physically assaulted by his last previous four girlfriends and his wife. Finally woke up and he's like, yeah, but I don't want to be the victim. Turns out he was abused by his dad and he did not acknowledge the pain of his younger self. And so my work with him was to help him fall into and really let himself just, just really like um, surrender and feel the pain of his, his victimhood, of his woundings, and really honor that. Give himself permission to experience all of that. And in so doing, move through those victim states into a sense of strength because he's now supported his wounded self. So it's either one that I've noticed with our cycle breakers who come in, they're either stuck in victimhood and they just can't seem to feel their, their way out of it or they refuse to acknowledge it. Either one of those extremes are not healthy. It's important for us to identify, to face, to feel, to move through it and then to share it in a way that feels uh, empathetically unapologetic. That's the only way to create secure relationships. So the invitation for all of us, this is kind of like the path that we take people through, is from victim. Once you see, if you are relating to this, you're like, fuck, I'm always the victim. 
constantly feeling victimized, scared about everything. I'm a perpetrator magnet going from one perpetrator to another every single week. And I'm tired of it. Some of you aren't going to be tired of it. Some of you actually formed an identity through your victimhood. You might be getting insurance or narcissistic supply from your victimhood. That's one of the uh, kind of like the red flags that I look for. Be wary of people who are constantly playing victim so that they can receive narcissistic supply or money. If you're, if you're using your victimhood to get money, that's a red flag. That's huge. That's a hallmark. If you look at the textbook of narcissism, that's where it is. If you know people like that and they're using their victimhood to get money, huge red flag, right? So that's one of the ways that I know if there's legitimate, you know, if the person is legitimately a victim, you know, first of all, the, the ideal victim in psychology, when you look at the whole concept of what victimhood is, there's only one, the most ideal situation for victimhood. And here it is. When, let's say, a woman is walking on the street and she just left a restaurant and somebody who doesn't know this woman walks up to her and mugs her, takes her money you know, hits her or whatever, injures her, and then runs away. They don't know one another. That is the, that is the kind of like the framework of what they call in psychology an ideal victim. You know, you don't know somebody. You, you it was, there was no connection between you and the perpetrator. But in most scenarios, when it's husband and wife, you know, partners together, co-workers together. There's usually a backstory, a dynamic. There's what we call a drama triangle happening, right? In that case of the woman who just got mugged where she didn't know what the perpetrator was, that's an ideal victim. That's a true victim, okay? There was nothing anyone could do. Or a child, do you know what I mean? There's no, you know, that this child that gets kidnapped, you know, that's an ideal victim. There's no way that there was an, any type of entanglement or interaction like relationally between them. That's what an ideal victim is. But most of the time, there is a drama triangle where there's a victim, there's a perpetrator, and there's a rescuer. And the victim was at one point was a uh, rescuer that was so tired of feeling rescue, of being rescuing and exhausting themselves that they just felt victimized and then they turn into a perpetrator, which then takes the perpetrator, turns them into the victim. They get pissed and then turn around and perpetrate the victim. This is Steve uh, Cartman's drama triangle. And if you're involved in a friendship or a relationship, huge red flag. Pay attention. We talk about this in our overview experience workshops and how to heal from trauma bonds. We got to be able to see where we're the victim, where we're the perpetrator, and when you're where you're the rescuer or hero. Unless you're able to see your role in all three, and by the way, our narcissistic parts don't ever want to see us as the perpetrator. No, I'm the innocent victim here. But the what makes me safe in a relationship with you Imagine you and I are in a relationship. It makes me a much better partner, a much better friend when I have the ability to see based on our values where I could be a threat to your values, where I could be a villain in your story so that I can be conscious, not tiptoe, but be conscious, be empathetically unapologetic in my relational dynamics with you so that I can know when I've crossed a boundary and then make a repair. Because we're all imperfect. We're never gonna get it right all the time. But those of us who've been stuck in victimhood for more than something happened two years, three years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago, and you're still identifying yourself as a survivor, you might still be a victim. Okay, even though you're saying, no, I'm not a victim anymore. I'm a survivor. Yeah, but you're identifying with that person or that thing. I'm a narcissistic 
abuse survivor, and it was 20 years ago, it was five years ago. Do you really want to identify yourself with that? Do you want to edify that individual and make them like your, your existence, your identity based on that thing? That's really unhealthy. Those of us who stay in victimhood for longer than like a couple of years aren't healthy. Your digestion will be shot. This is my kind of clinical side coming in. Your digestion will be shot, your chronic fatigue, autoimmune. Every one of those peeps that I would see in my office, they were constant victims, which isn't doesn't invalidate their pain. But when do you want to start to identify yourself as something other than your illness, other than your former partner, other than your medical condition. When? Those are the people that we work with. We're, we're definitely, I'm not everyone's cup of tea, but when somebody has been identifying themselves with that, doing their therapies, telling their victim stories and having it validated, it feels great. But that's only because you haven't yet learned to validate yourself. To answer your other part of your question, Sandra, it's not wrong to want validation, but the question is like, we all, we all have little childlike parts that want validation. I certainly love getting DMS and comments on these videos that say, this is really helpful. It's changed my life. It validates all the hard work that I've done. But the question is, am I using your validation of me as my oxygen? If it is, there's a fine line, isn't there? Right. So there is a time where I lived for external validation. If I wasn't getting it one day, then I felt depressed. That becomes an addiction because we haven't yet learned to love ourselves. We haven't done the work. We haven't gotten past the victimhood from our past story. And Sandra, some of the language that I've seen and your participation with your permission, I'm going to say it feels like there's some victim stories that are still living in your body, not even conscious, even though you might be going, oh, yeah. I totally wrote a, a forgiveness letter. I'd let it go. Uh, I can feel that there are some victim stories that are still stuck in your body and you're unconscious. And that's when we move it to the next level, which is manifester. So the victim, it happened to me. This is to me. Manifester. To get to manifester, we have to let go of blame. Stop blaming yourself. Don't blame the other person. You get to the next level. The manifester says, it's going to, did it happen to me? Yeah, but now it's going to happen by me. Manifester now says, fuck this. I'm going to do it. And then you start to do the journaling and the affirmations and you start moving forward. But after a couple years of that, you get exhausted and you get burnout. <laughs> Hello, me too. Uh, then the next phase of your healing journey is to get into a state of being a channeler. Where you don't, you know, you're now, this is about making it happen. Manifester is about making shit happen. Channeler is about making shit welcome. This is really about letting, and to become from a manifester to a channeler, which is what I've been working on. I consider myself, depending on where my nervous system is at, a channeler, because I'm channeling all of this. My transmissions are pure channeling. I, they're not scripted. I just kind of come from the heart because I'm channeling my, what's inside to you. And this is what your trauma heal is from my trauma healing work. You become a channeler. You become kind of like able to flow. You go with the flow with, of life. And to become a channeler from a manis, manifester, you have to let go of control. You got to let go of control. And so the next phase after channeler is to become one with the universe. One with God or universe. And in that space, one with the universe here, let me just pop it open up here to become one with the universe. Can't really see my writing. You have to be willing to let go of the idea of separation. There it is. So going from victimhood 
to manifester, to channeler, to one with the universe, the main factor is healing, in integrating your shadows, healing with the younger parts of yourself, learning how to take your triggers, turning them into deeper intimacy, learning how to take your victim stories that are stuck in your body, surrendering and releasing them in a community container with a guide who's able to give you feedback so that you can kind of come to terms with some of your blind spots that you're carrying. And so that is why I love doing what I do. That's my zone of genius. And so hopefully that has been of service to you. Uh, it's not wrong to want validation and to like validation. I think that makes you human. Uh, is it part of codependency? Mm -hmm. Only when you are so reliant on it that you don't really, you're so dissociated from yourself that you're needing that as oxygen from that one person. That's codependency. When you are so devoid of giving that to yourself because of your traumas, you've been arrested development as a child and you need it from the many, that's more kind of like the narcissistic traits and the narcissist and the codependent are beautiful mirror reflections of one another that create that trauma bond. I've been there, I've done that, I've gone through the cycle, I've healed it, and now I've been able to create a secure relationship, which is why it makes my heart sing to help guide other people through. So if this is resonating with you and you would love some help, you'd like some feedback, send me a DM, give me your backstory, uh, and let's see if we're a fit. Let's see if you're ready to receive guidance from somebody who uh, will tell it like it is, not just kind of placate you, but uh, not tell you what you want to hear, but tell you what you need to hear so that you can create secure relationships and have your home be a sanctuary and the kids be raised in environments that they're modeled secure attachments and love so they can create secure attachment. The cycle didn't start with you, but it can end with you. See you at the next perfect time. Make sure you subscribe. Let me know what came up for you in the comments, what your biggest takeaways are, and I'll see you at the next perfect time.